Sometimes what is written in the scriptures can be controversial. Sometimes what's written in the scriptures can be misunderstood or highly contested. Sometimes it's very controversial, very contested. Sometimes what's written in the scriptures is rejected by our society. Today we come to a portion of God's word that is controversial and that has been highly contested. And at least one verse in our passage today is really hard to understand. It's hard to determine exactly what Paul meant when he wrote the last verse in our passage today. And I I think Peter would agree with the assessment that we have just made of this passage that it's sometimes hard to understand. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter, writing about Paul, says, Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them, of these matters. There are some things, and then Peter's saying, listen, there's some, some things that Paul writes about that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So sometimes the scriptures are a little bit hard to understand, and this is coming from the Apostle Peter. However, just because it's hard to understand or it's controversial doesn't mean that we shouldn't study it and discern the truths and how they apply to our lives. So this is the beauty and the peril of going through a portion of Scripture or a book of the Scripture verse by verse like we're doing. You don't get the option of cherry-picking your passages. You have to go through and you have to deal with each and every verse. And so today, we're going to be talking about in a portion of this service, in a portion of the sermon, we're going to be talking about the S word, submit. And we're going to be talking about women submitting and being submissive. So you might want to buckle up. You might want to buckle up. And in just in case of a crash, Connor... Uh, I do have my hard hat. So we're going to buckle up today, and we're going to take the scripture and see what it has to say about a healthy, gospel-shaped community. This is the sixth sermon, sixth message in our series, Blueprints for a Healthy Gospel Community Church. And we've been marching through the book of 1 Timothy. And in the first chapter, Paul writes to this young pastor, Timothy. And the first chapter is all about false teachers and how they've infiltrated the church. And how their teaching has gotten into the bloodstream of the church of Ephesus. And because their false teaching has infected the church at Ephesus, there's some issues that need to be dealt with. Last week... We talked about prayer because prayer is important. Prayer is, should be a priority and it should be plentiful. And so last week we talked about the importance of prayer in a gospel-shaped community. And this week we're going to move on to more characteristics of what a gospel-shaped healthy church looks like. Paul tells us why he wrote this letter. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul hoped to come to Timothy soon. He was stuck in Rome, but he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So Paul is writing to this young pastor, Timothy, and he's saying, you've got some issues that you need to deal with. The goal here is a healthy gospel church. And so I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to give you some pointers so that you can instruct your folks on how they should behave as the church of the living God. So we come to our passage today, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And here's how we're going to proceed. We're going to read the passage, and then I'm going to pray, 
And then we will work our way through the passage verse by verse and observe five characteristics of the healthy gospel-centered gathering of believers. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Paul writes to Timothy, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. There it is. There is our task before us today is to rightly divide the word of God, to be able to discern the truth that is in here and how it applies to our church, Sharon Woods Church. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, as we come to your word, we are grateful for your word, every single part of it. Lord, we're thankful for this letter that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to young Timothy. And Lord, as we come to it, open our hearts and our minds to receive from you. Lord, help us to discern how we can apply your word that was written a couple thousand years ago to our modern day context. Lord, help us today to make steps. Whatever step that you have for us in our spiritual journey, Lord, help us to make one step closer to Jesus. Help us to make one step in our sanctification process. Lord, help us to see you and your beauty and your love for us a little bit clearer today. In Jesus' name, amen. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Are you guys buckled up? You ready? Here we go. Now remember, this is God's word. This isn't my word. God wrote this. He inspired the Apostle Paul to write it, so don't shoot the messenger. This is God's message. This is his word, and it's meant for our good and for his glory. Now, the setting here is the local gathered church. When we come together for worship, when we come together to sing, and when we come together to pray, when we come together to hear the word preached, when we come together to do the one another's, to encourage one another, to edify one another, to carry one another's burdens, that's the context in which Timothy is receiving these instructions. So I want us to keep that in the back of our mind today as we work through the passage. The first point is that a healthy gospel community displays, it has, it exhibits, it enjoys, it, it boasts, it contains, it, it possesses surrendered men. It possesses surrendered men. Look at verse 8. I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. A healthy gospel-centered community has men that pray. Men that pray. Men that prioritize prayer. Men that pray in every place. Men that pray over every ministry, every person within the context of the local church. Men, we like to do things in our own strength. But we should do things out of God's strength. And one of the ways that we do that is to surrender ourselves in prayer and depend upon God to give us the strength to be the men that he has called us to be. And how are we to pray? We're supposed to pray by lifting holy hands. This would have been the common practice in Paul's time. When people prayed, they would pray standing, and they would pray with their hands lifted up. When you pray with your hands lifted up, when you raise your hands, this is a picture of surrender. It's a picture of the posture of your heart. It's a physical picture 
of how your heart should be. Because when you surrender, you expose your sides, you expose your vital organs. On the battlefield, if you've been defeated and it's time to surrender, you lay down your weapons, you lay down everything that you're fighting with, and you hold your hands up, and you surrender yourself, and you put yourself into the hands of the ones you are surrendering to. And when we surrender, when men surrender in prayer to Jesus, that's how we can be real men. That's how we can lead with strength, because we lead out of the strength of surrender to Christ. This is a sharp contrast to anger and quarreling. Because Paul says men should be lifting holy hands and praying without anger and without quarreling. Because angry words, loudness, domineering, clenched fist, ready to fight, that is not the men that God has called us to be. Men, anger and quarreling and domineering has no place in your life. It has no place in your home. It has no place in your church. It has no place in your family. It has no place in your vocation. It has no place in public. It has no place in your online spaces. It has no place for a follower of Christ. We are to lift our, holy, lift our hands in holy prayer without anger and without quarreling. Because when we surrender, when we are surrendered to God, when we are surrendered, then we can lead in love. And we can lead out of the strength that God provides when we surrender to him. So, sir, how about you? Last week was all about prayer. Are you a praying kind of man? Are you prioritizing prayer? Are you praying all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people? God's not looking for macho men. He doesn't need tough guys. He needs guys that are surrendered, who are willing to pray and lift holy hands and allow him to inform how they should speak, how they should lead, how they should act, and how they should think. A man's role, his calling in every place is to lead through surrender, without anger, without quarreling, without domineering. So a healthy gospel community displays, has, boasts, enjoys surrendered men, but it also has saintly women. Saintly women. Look at verse 9. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. Likewise. Likewise is this connecting word in this verse, and it connects back to Verse 8, connecting the instruction about how women are to conduct themselves back to the way that men should conduct themselves. Men are supposed to be surrendered in prayer for the health of the entire church. And women, a women's conduct should also edify the entire church as well. So I just want to pause here just for a moment. We're going to mention five things that are characteristics of a healthy gospel church. But now these aren't the entirety, the totality of what a healthy gospel church is. It's just that there was these specific things that needed to be addressed at the church of Ephesus. And so Paul is writing, and so in these few verses, we're just pulling out what Paul is instructing Timothy to that could apply to every single church. We're observing five specific things here. The first one was that men were not surrendering themselves in prayer. That's an issue, and it needs to be corrected. And then some women at the church were treating the gathering as a fashion show. And that was an issue that needed to be corrected. This verse is not a ban on wearing jewelry. It's not a ban on wearing expensive clothing. It's not a ban on braided hair. It's not a ban on wearing pearls. But these things are singled out because in Paul's day, they were a sign of extravagance and selfishness and pointing towards yourself and prioritizing yourself. And they were unconscionable for followers of Jesus. For women to dress this way 
in the presence of others, many other people in the church that would not have been able to afford this type of stuff. These women were just being showy. Instead of wearing good works, instead of dressing themselves, adorning themselves with saintly behavior. They were being show off, and instead of being the, the women that they should be, they were calling attention to themselves. You could say that some of them were probably dressing immodestly because call, Paul calls and says, hey, they should be dressing modestly. So it's not a leap to think that some of them were not dressing in modest apparel. Now, like, I'm the worst person to talk to about fashion. <clears throat> Got an amen. <laughs> I don't know anything about fashion. I'd be up here in a t-shirt if it was all up to me. My wife and my daughters have picked out uh, my shirts, and so if you don't like this shirt, it's not on me. It's on Corinne or Haley or Tessa. So I'm not going to try and tell you ladies how you should dress. But God is. Look at verse 10. Women should dress with what is proper for women who profess godliness. And how should they dress? How they should be they adorned? With good works. The most beautiful adornment a woman can wear is good works. It is saintly behavior, a saintly demeanor. This is proper for one who professes godliness. Her adornment, her saintly behavior, her, her walk should match her talk, her profession of godliness. So ladies, endeavor to be and not to appear. Endeavor to be and not to appear. Endeavor to be, not to appear. Endeavor to be clothed in good works, in saintly behavior, and not to appear stunning or sensual, or those type of things. Endeavor to be, not to appear. The goal is to be adorned in good works. And so I had a note on my sermon notes here to observe the ladies this morning and so that I could give some specific examples of of ones that have adorned themselves with good works. <clears throat> and you know what? <clears throat> I saw many of you adorning yourself with good works. I saw humble service. I saw people stepping in and doing things to help other people. I saw humility. I saw people crying with other people, bearing their burdens. And so, if you ask me next week, hey, what did I wear last week? Like your physical clothing, I'm not going to remember. But what people will remember about you is when you adorn yourself with good works, when you dress yourself in humility, when you dress yourself in love, and you bless the church with that type of saintly behavior. A healthy gospel community displays surrendered men, saintly women. And our next point is it displays submissive women. Now maybe I should get back into my seatbelt here. And maybe this is the point that I need to put on my helmet. But hang with me for a few moments. The word submit, submissiveness, it's, it's not a popular word in our culture today. And it may be getting some of you lady folks kind of tensed, ready for battle right now. Now, submit, it may not be popular, but it's biblical. It may not be popular, but it's biblical. And if it's biblical, we need to understand it, we need to embrace it, and we need to act upon it. Look at Ephesians 5.21. I want to just kind of give an overview of what this word submit means and this principle of submissiveness and then go back to our passage and apply it in the way that the passage is telling us to apply it. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And in Ephesians 5, 21, he's addressing the whole body before he gets to the passage about wives and husbands. And so we are to submit to one another. We are to defer to one another, just like Christ put, set aside his own interests and put our interests first. So we are supposed to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Jesus, who submitted to the will of the Father and came and gave his all for us. Out of reverence for our Savior, out of reverence for the one who said, not my will be done, but your will be done, who submitted himself to the will of another. When we submit in a biblical way, it's an outworking of the two greatest commandments, love God and love others. So let's define to submit. To submit is to accept and live out your divinely ordained role in life and existence. To submit is to accept and live out your divinely ordained role in your life. To submit is to accept and live out how God has divinely ordained your role and your life to be. For example, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Ephesians 5.1. Got another amen. Children, when you practice this principle of submission by obeying your parents, by honoring your mother and father, it pleases the Lord. And why? Because God has ordained that you are the children and that the parents are the parents. God chose that you would be the child. God chose who your parents were going to be. You accept your divinely ordained role for your existence in your life. Likewise, citizens are to submit to governing authorities. As long as the laws don't violate God's laws, we're supposed to submit. So it pleases God when you look at the speed limit that ODOT has posted and you keep it. Because we're supposed to submit to the laws of the governing authorities, as long as they don't violate God's laws, because that's how he has ordained it to be. The church also is to submit to the leadership of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the head of the church, and we as the church submit to him. We take our divinely ordained role as his bride, as his church, as his redeemed, as his children. We submit to him. Wives are to submit to their husband because, because God has ordained that the husband is the head of the household. Now, men and women and children are of equal, eternal value. They are all image bearers of God, but children and men and women all have different God-assigned roles. And when we submit to that divine order, it pleases God. And quite frankly, it makes our lives a whole lot easier. Because when we buck the way that God has ordained things to be, things just don't go as well as when we do things God's way. So to submit is to accept and live out your divinely ordained role in life and existence. And I would even say with joy. With joy. Not out of obligation, but with joy because we have a loving God. We have a loving Savior who's ordained things to be best for us. And when we live that out, when we submit to the divine order, then things are just better. Things are just better. Now back to our passage. That's just kind of an overview of biblical submission. Back to our passage. The context is the local gathered church. And some women, I believe, have been listening to these false teachers because chapter 1 was all about false teachers and how they've gotten away from the gospel and the divine order of things. And now these women are usurping leadership in church. And they're being disruptive. And rather than let Timothy, the lead pastor, lead, certain women are usurping authority and exercising authority. And I believe uh, espousing, repeating, parroting the teachings of the false teachers. And it's got the whole place disrupted. Look at verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. So apparently this wasn't happening. There is some disruption going on. Verse 12. 
I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Another amen. This time from this section, we're moving over. (laughs) So what does this mean? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't mean. Being quiet doesn't mean that women should be silent in church. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4 and 5 is all about women who are praying and prophesying in church. And the thrust of that passage is, should a, should a woman wear a head covering or not wear a head covering while she's praying and prophesying? So it's, it's a mute point. Women are supposed to pray and prophesy. They're not supposed to be silent in church. So right here, this isn't when it says to be submissive and learn in all quietness and be quiet. It's not silence. However, it appears as if these women had embraced some boldness to be disruptive in the assembly. And instead of submitting and being quiet, they were being disruptive and they were a hindrance to biblical teaching. They were a hindrance to the gospel that was being proclaimed in that place. And now one thing that we can say that is crystal clear from this letter, that these women were supposed to submissively and quietly come under the authority, the leadership, the care, the shepherding, the counsel, and the teaching of their pastor, Timothy. That is very clear from this passage in the entire book of 1 Timothy, that these women, as well as the other members of the church, were to not listen to the false teachers, were not to get infected with things that weren't gospel-centered and that weren't biblically based. They were submit to submit to the authority of the one that God had called them to lead them as a faith family. And that would have been young Timothy, the pastor of this church, who was supposed to love and teach and shepherd and care for and protect and sacrificially minister to his flock. But instead, they were being disruptive. And Paul says, we don't need that. Another thing that's perfectly clear is that we are all to accept our God-ordained roles and submit to the the divine order. And so a healthy gospel community has women who practice biblical submission to, to one another, to their husbands, and to the leadership of the church. And now we'll explore... In two, in two upcoming sermons, when we roll into chapter 3, we're going to explore the leadership of the church as we spend one sermon on elders and one sermon on deacons. It's interesting that Paul is addressing this here, and then the next chapter he rolls into what the leadership qualifications are for elders and for deacons. Now, I was talking about this passage, this upcoming sermon last week with someone And just kind of in passing as we were talking, the comment was made, well, you know, a lot of times it seems like men aren't stepping up to the plate and leading or doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so women kind of step in and do what needs to be done. I would agree with that assessment that many times that is the case. And the eyeball test, you can take a look around here. There are more females here than males. And so... You guys know that I'm an accountant at heart, and I love numbers. And so I went back to our church management software that has everybody that's a member, a regular attender, a recent visitor, a participant, a volunteer at the produce market who doesn't attend here, all these folks that are in there. And let me get my numbers right. Within the church management and its software, so this is not a scientific thing at all, but it does give a general picture. There was 190 females. Guess how many males were listed in our church software? 107. So we have 190 females and 107 males. And so I'm not going to make any definitive judgments about that, but it's a picture of what's in this room and what's in our church management software And generally speaking, that women are more inclined to participate in things of faith than men. It ought not be that way. Women shouldn't have to take up men's slack. So why do men seem passive sometimes instead of passionate about Jesus and the gospel 
and about faith. Well, a healthy gospel community displays surrendered men and saintly women and submissive women. And also a healthy gospel community should display, should possess, should have, should enjoy, should revel in strong men. Strong men. The church needs biblically strong men. And now this passage reaches back to Adam and Eve. Look at verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is just a blunt statement of truth and the order of creation. Adam was formed first, then Eve. God formed, God created Adam first. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, man. Not in the beginning, angels. Not in the beginning, women. Not in the beginning, anything else. In the beginning, God created, and he ordered things the way that he wanted them ordered. He designed, he decided, he set up the divine order, he created male and female, he assigned them different roles, he created them in his image, which makes us all of infinite value and worth. However, he did create us to have different roles. I can't even believe that what I'm about to say is controversial. God designed women to have children and men not to. But even in our culture, it seems like that's controversial. But, I mean, it's just as plain as the nose on your face that we're created different and that women were designed to have children and men were not. It's obvious that we have differing roles. And that extends to the physical realm, the spiritual realm, and how things are set up in the household. Now, God assigned different and distinct roles to men and women. He designed the man to lovingly lead and protect and provide for his wife and his family. We see this clearly because after Adam and Eve had sinned, God takes his normal walk in the garden where he's going to hang out with Adam and Eve, and they're hiding. Adam and Eve are hidden in the bushes, got some fig leaves around them. And what does God say? He says, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? God already knew they were in a mess. He knew that they had disobeyed. But who does he call for? He calls for Adam. Because Adam was responsible, yes, for his own actions, but he was also responsible for his wife and his household. Now, Eve, she's not off the hook. She's responsible for her individual actions and her choices. She is responsible, but she's not responsible for the household because that's not the way God designed it. Look at verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Focus in on that first phrase. And Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. When the serpent was there talking to his wife, when the serpent was there saying, well, I don't really think God is as good as he says he is. Are you sure about these loving commands? They're not, he's really holding out on you. And while Satan is having this conversation with Eve, Adam, he's off to the side just watching it happen. And the scriptures say Adam was not deceived. He knew what was going on. He was not deceived, but he was passive. Adam was not deceived, but he was passive. And he didn't fulfill the God-given role that he had to protect his wife. He should have said, hey, honey, you know what? Someone's talking bad about God and how he's not good and how his commands are holding out on us. Come over here and let's talk about this. Let's have a conversation. But Adam was passive. He just stood there and let it happen. And Eve, she's culpable too. She's responsible. Because when someone started talking to him and it was twisting God's word and she was confused and she really didn't understand exactly what was happening, she she should have said, you know what? You need to go talk to Adam. You need to go. This this isn't my decision. I'm kind of confused here. I'm not sure what you're saying. It doesn't sound right. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. But go talk to Adam. So 
So Eve, the wife, should have deferred to her husband and said, you take care of this situation. I'm not sure how we got here or why we're here or why we're talking to this person or whatever, but Adam, you need to take care of it. And Adam should have stepped up and taken care of the mess. He should have had dominion over the animals, like God had told him, and should have said, you go away. But he didn't. He was not deceived, but he was passive. Which brings us to an observation that we can make about men. It seems like that we have a trouble staying down that biblical lane of fulfilling our role as men. And what we tend to do is we tend to either be passive or domineering. God's not looking for passive men. He's not looking for domineering men. He's looking for godly, biblical men who submit to his divine order, who aren't passive, who are willing to stand up and protect the ones they're supposed to protect and to stand on biblical truth. And he's not looking for people who are domineering and angry and quarreling and who get their way by intimidation and threats. He's looking for men who surrender and submit to the position that he's given them to lovingly lead and protect. And so in this moment, when Adam was standing by passively, and Eve was engaged in this conversation, and then she disobeys, she becomes a transgressor, she disobeys God's command, and then she encourages Adam to do it too, and he just goes ahead and does it. From this moment in time, the roles of genders and a husband and wife have been distorted and confused. In that moment, things got a little sideways. The train ran off the tracks because men and women are kind of confused about how things are supposed to be. But there's good news. There is good news. Jesus Christ came. And the gospel is here, and it redeems, and it restores, and it reconciles, and it puts back into correct order the things that got messed up because of sin, because Jesus paid it all. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. He put others first, you, and he paid the price so that your life could be restored And in one very small way, one little area of your life, that you can embrace and be surrendered to him and embrace the biblical role that he has for you, whether you're a woman or a man or a wife or a husband or a child or a parent or a leader. The gospel empowers us to fulfill our god given roles and the divine order is not men passively standing by and the divine order is not men threatening and domineering and being angry and quarreling the divine order is for strong men to lovingly and sacrificially lead a healthy gospel community displays surrendered men it it displays saintly women and submissive women and strong men, but also synchronized gospel community. We need to be unified and in sync. Verse 15, this first phrase is very confusing to me. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And she, singular, it seems to point back towards Eve, or maybe it points back to the women that they were talking about, because then it changes to the plural, if they. So it's kind of confusing. What we know for sure, though, is that you don't have to be a woman to be saved because men can't have children. She will be saved through childbearing because Paul has already presented the gospel plan twice in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, when he gave his testimony, he talked about how Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And last week, we looked at verses 4 through 6, where there's one mediator between God and man, 
And that's the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom so that we could be saved. And so we know that you don't have to be a woman to be saved and you don't have to be a woman who's had a child to be saved. We know that that's not what this is saying. Now some theologians, uh, some of whom I highly respect, uh, say that this points back to Genesis 3.15 where God promised a deliverer, a redeemer, and it points back to there and that women will be saved through childbearing because the descendant of Eve gave birth to the Messiah, Jesus. I'm not buying it, but I kind of said this in a small group this morning. That's not a hill I'm not, that's a hill I'm not worth dying on. So that, that phrase right there, we know how the plan of salvation works. And this is the only place that it alludes to something about childbearing and salvation. So it's a bit confusing. But what I want to focus on in this verse is the tail end. So we can say this for sure. It says, if they, and I believe it refers back to the gospel community, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And what this is saying is, is that we need to be synchronized. We need to be unified. We need to agree on the main things so that we can be on mission and so that the church in a local place can gather together and be synchronized, be in sync, be unified on the mission that God has given them. Have you ever seen synchronized swimming? It's a sport, you know, in the Olympics. I remember the first time that I saw this synchronized swimming thing, and there's these people that are like upside down and sideways, and there's a whole group of them, and like they're in unison. And they can't really see each other, and they're swimming, and it was amazing to me because, one, I can't swim very well, and I can't dance at all. And so it seemed like that the uh, combination of both, of the swimming and the dancing and the choreography, was just amazing. They were in sync. They were unified. And that's a picture of what a gospel-centered church, a local gathered church, should be. We should be in sync. We should be unified so that we can accomplish the mission that God has given us. And the mission that God has given us here is we exist, Sharon Woods Church exists, to worship God, to put Him supremely, to put Him first in all areas of our lives and as a church family. We exist to worship God and to develop multi-generational disciples, to lead people along the path of getting to know Jesus better and better. We exist to develop multi-generational disciples, to lead people along the path of discipleship, encouraging them, giving them practical means to make their next steps towards a greater and deeper relationship with Jesus. We exist to worship God and develop multi-generational disciples in our community through the power of the gospel. And we need to be in sync to do that. So a healthy gospel community displays surrendered men and saintly women and submissive women and strong men and a synchronized gospel community. Would you pray with me, please?